salutations to everybody out there in podcast land. This is the Judo Chop Suey Podcast, and I'm your host, Judo Dave Roman, wishing you a very happy new year to you all. Hopefully, it's not too late for me to wish you a happy new year. I think the the moratorium on New Year's wishes is about two weeks, and we're about in that part right now. I'm recording this. Actually, we're about three weeks into the new year as this is, I'm recording this on January 21st, just a couple days after my birthday. I'm still waiting for your birthday wishes. Thank you very much. Actually, not really. I only turned 43 years old. No milestone birthday for me. So it was a nice, quiet birthday, and I'm ready to move on from that. So no birthday wishes. I haven't actually talked to you guys in quite some time. I, I'm not going to get into too much detail on you know what happened basically over the past month because I had I had the episode with with Cody and I, I very much enjoyed that episode but you know as I usually like to get to and in my podcast as I talk about things going on in my life and things going on with training I'm gonna get to plenty of that my cruise went was fantastic in case you were wondering and I'm sure you weren't my Christmas was great in case you were wondering and I'm also sure that you weren't and I've had a very nice new year so far. The month has flown by, I, I got to tell you, and I'm back to training. And so on this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about my training routine. And I'm going to talk a little bit about my uh, fitness routine when it comes to lifting weights at the gym. Because in, a conversa- in the conversation that I had after the episode ended with Cody, he brought up that you know we, we started talking about lifting weights and the type of routine that I do it for my age. And he said, yeah, you know what? You probably should talk about that on your podcast. And I said, you know what, Cody? I think you're right. So I'm going to talk about that and it, with the perspective of being a middle-aged man because, you know, you young guys, you, you guys could do anything and you're going to put on muscle, but it's a little bit different when you're in, in your middle age. You're, the, the body changes, the body responds differently than it did in the 20s so or in your 20s so I'm going to talk a little bit about my routine and maybe that'll help a few of you older gentlemen out there and give you perspective on what I do and what I have found successful over the past several months I also want to talk a little bit about Ogoshi in this episode which is a throw that I've been practicing lately it's always interesting to go back to throws that I you know a lot of people you know, especially people who are experienced, they don't go back to the basics. I, I, I'm i certainly guilty of that. And Ogoshi is a throw that I've decided to go back to just to make sure that my technique is spot on. And turns out there's some work that I could do with that. Uh, there's, there's a lot of work and a lot of improvement there. So I want to talk a little bit about my experiences working with Ogoshi, Ogoshi lately. And as usual, there's always judo tidbit, judo news. I got something specific um, in regards to USA Judo, a couple of news items that you U.S. Americans uh, might be able to find some interest. And a couple of weekends ago was the IGF Referee and Coaching Seminar. I'm going to get a little bit into that because there's some items that I think you guys will find very interesting and most likely very disappointing all at the same time. I did not watch it over the weekend like I did last year, it, it was, I just figure this time around, I'm just going to get a synopsis of what was talked about and what was covered. And I'll share some of that with you guys. But first, I want to talk a little bit about what's been going on with me. Get, you know, that this is the part where I like to call the housekeeping items and such. There's really one thing I wanted to talk about in the housekeeping section. And that's Star Wars. Now, look, if you haven't seen the film, uh, there is going to be spoilers in this. I highly suggest if you don't want to be spoiled that you take a look at my podcast show notes and that'll tell you the timestamp when I start getting into the rest of the items. But I've been wanting to talk about Star Wars and I got to say it was just bad. It, the, the movie did not work for me at all between... You know, Leia flying through space with force powers we've never seen her use before. You know, looking like Mary Poppins. And new other force powers of telepathy and astral projection. You had subplots that just didn't go anywhere. The opening battle scene where they're dropping bombs. 
onto these these big star destroyers. It was I was thinking to myself, come on, this is this isn't World War Two, and and you know you're you're bombing some country or aircraft carriers. This is Star Wars. You should be able to launch these missiles from like you, you know a galaxy away or something. I I, I don't know. It, it didn't make sense. It, it there were a lot of jokes that just fell flat. The the whole scene when when Finn was in, in that that girl was riding through the casino, saving these these mammoth looking horses and and getting this 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 thief that's supposed to help them and he turns on them and it just it was just really really weird. And the thing is, I really wanted to like this movie. I, I mean, look. As soon as saw, I saw Princess Leia flying, looking like Mary Poppins, I said to myself, oh no, this is, it, oh no. It, it, it kind of reminded me of the first scene when I saw uh, Jar Jar Binks in The Phantom Menace. I said the same thing back then, oh no. He's embarrassing. And it just, just didn't feel like Star Wars to me. Maybe I'm just becoming an old coot or something. I, I, I don't know. It just... I thought The Force Awakens felt like a Star Wars movie. It wasn't perfect, but it felt like a Star Wars movie. And like I said, I've said before, I love Rogue One. I, I thought that was brilliant. A lot of people didn't, but I happen to love it. And my friend said this was the best Star Wars movie by, by far. And then once, once I was finished seeing the movie, I texted him and asked him if he was, was, you know, if this was a practical joke or something, if he was just messing with me because... I gotta say, I don't know. I left that f theater feeling, man. What did I just watch? Maybe Star Wars have passed me by. I I, I don't know. It, it just it didn't have that same feel. I guess a lot of younger kids and teens and, and newer audiences love the movies because of its I, I don't know some of its themes that maybe appeal to that generation. I I just. I, I, oh yeah, I love the part when Yoda shows up and then calls down lightning to burn up the old Jedi uh, library. Like, hey, Yoda, where was that in Return of the Jedi when Luke was fighting Emperor Palpatine and Darth Vader at the same time? You know, he could have really used the lightning bolt or two at, at, at that moment. You, you know, I mean, just that made no sense to me whatsoever. A, a, a Yoda calling the, a, a dead Yoda... <laughs> Calling down a physical lightning to burn a a, a a a library. Like I said, I don't know. You got Snoke. You, you Snoke dies, and he really wasn't an important character at all. It just just a weird movie, man. And and I don't know. I just I didn't like it. I don't really care for the direction Star Wars is going. But I'm a chump and I'm going to keep paying to see Star Wars. Every time, every time they pump something out into the theaters, I'm going to pay to watch it because I'm just a big chump. What would be really cool is if they they the studios went down the Kyle Katarn uh, road and told uh, and told those stories. If if you guys are gamers out there back in the you know you know, 15 years ago or so, the, the Jedi Knight series of video games, the story of Kyle Katarn was very interesting. Now, if they did something like that, a kind of akin to Rogue One, tell the alternate story of Star Wars and, and just tell different stories, I, I think that would be really interesting. But chances are they're not going to go down that road because they really think that they're going down a great road with this new series of movies. I, I don't know. So... If I spoiled it for you, well, sorry about that. But I did warn you that there would be spoilers here. And if you guys love this movie, I would love to hear from you. I would love for you to explain to me why you love this movie. Feel free to shoot me an email at judochopsueyshow at gmail.com. You could always tweet to me, at Lavita Judoka. You can follow me on Instagram, which is also at Lavita Judoka. And my Facebook page, you can always reach out to me by doing a search for the Judo Chop Suey podcast. I'm sure you'll find me there. It's not that hard. So I want to talk a little bit about my weightlifting routine. And as I mentioned earlier in the episode, um, in my last episode when I had a conversation with Cody, talk, uh, we had a conversation, if you want to call it, off the air. And, you know, I was telling him about, I was asking about his fitness routine and I was telling him, what I was doing and, and, and why I was doing it. And 
he had suggested, hey, you know what, I should bring this up on the podcast at some point. So I figured I'd do that right now. Now, lifting weights is not new to me. I throughout throughout my life, really, I've had times where I've done it for a year, year and a half, two years, and then I've taken a break. I've done it, and I've taken a break. I've gone back and forth. I I really don't know why. I think um, life got in the way, expenses got in the way, and some days have sometimes have just been better than others for me to lift weights. And so I'm. It's my on again. I'm back on lifting weights, and I'm hoping that this time around I'm really going to stick with it for a much longer term than a year, a year and a half or so. But I decided to start lifting weights uh, probably the an hour or two after the open Rondori session I had at Ybor City Jiu-Jitsu back in, in late October. when they I talked about this a few episodes ago when we had it. There was an open mat and, and many different clubs showed up and stuff. I was very much out of shape. And really my entire body was very... Uh, I wouldn't go sore, but... I was very fatigued a lot more than I felt that I should have been. Now, granted, I normally don't do these open sessions. I haven't had many of these big Rondori sessions um, over the past couple of years, but this was an opportunity that I couldn't pass up. And I know they're going to be having another one at some point soon, I would think, and I'll definitely be there. But I was exhausted after that workout. And about six days later, I, I signed up for a gym and started my workout routine. Now, I want to preface all of this by saying that I'm not some kind of know-it-all when it comes to lifting weights. But as Cody and I were discussing in the last episode off the air, there could be a perspective that I can give some of you guys that may be helpful, especially for you you middle-aged guys out there. I know I've got a I, a, a fair number of listeners of, of people who are in their middle age. And by, by middle age, I'm talking about, you know, 35 to 65, let's just say. Um, even though some people would call 65 elderly, I don't. Um, but some do, I don't. But for you younger guys out there, you don't realize it. Yeah, you hear the stories, but you don't realize it. The body really does change um, once you start hitting your 30s. For me, um, I didn't start slowing down till I was about 32, 33 years old. That's when I started noting, noticing a difference. Uh, noticing a difference in how I heal, noticing a drop in my speed, um, recovery times and such. It, it really does change. So, so when I did a lot of weightlifting in the past, I always approached it as if I was still in my 20s. And I found that a lot of times I was really injuring myself um, badly. It, it seemed like every time I was going to the gym, I was pulling muscles left and right. Um, so much to the point that the, the last, um, you know, as I mentioned before, I, I've been up and down when it comes to lifting weights over the years. So probably the last time I was dedicated to lifting weights was about really now three years ago. And back then... I could not do squats twice a week. So I'm going to get into some of the details on what I do. There's really not a lot, but one of the things that I always try and do in my workout routines, um, and I just couldn't do it until this time around, is squats. Um, and, and I've always tried to do squats twice a week, and I just couldn't do it because I kept pulling my muscles. But this time around, I have not had these kind of injuries, and I attribute it to really going above and beyond by most people's standards when it comes to my warm up. So so before I get into that here's my routine. It's based off of if you guys heard of strong lifts or starting strength, it's based off of that uh, essentially. I do 3 sets of 5 repetitions um and I do that for squats, I do that for the bench press, the overhead press, and I do rows. And I also do deadlifts, but I don't do deadlifts uh, three sets of five. Um, not at the moment anyway. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. Some days I'll alternate the, 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 you know, the, the pull downs with the rows or, or the rows with the pull downs. Um, and I, I try to go to the gym 
um, every three days. And in on the days where those days land on, on a judo day, I try and do my workout before judo and not afterwards. I have found for myself that if I do a workout after judo or, or the morning after a night class, um, my results are not uh, very good. My my I normally don't have a good um, experience. Now I'm sure some of you guys, when I mentioned earlier that this is based off of starting strength, um, I believe the fellow who created that basic program is Mark Rippletoe. Uh, I like the program a lot. I know some of you experienced lifters probably roll your eyes at it, but for me at my age, um, I need to protect my body and and not do. Things that really are too much for me to handle. And right now, and the, and the big thing for me too, unlike a lot of you young guys, and I'm not, believe me, I'm not putting any young guys down, but uh, yeah, there's the but. No, I'm not. What I'm trying to say is you guys that are in your early 20s, you're in college and stuff, you really have a lot more time to spend at the gym than somebody who's uh, in their middle age. You, you Typically, guys in their 20s and college, they don't have four kids. They're not married. They don't have a full-time job. They're not commuting an hour and a half to each way to work. So I needed a routine that I could do within an hour and targets the major muscle groups and uh, improves my strength. And I found for me... Doing this routine works best for me. So I basically, I alternate my routines uh, every three days that I go to the gym, three or four days, uh, four days tops. If I, if it's every, if I exceed four days, then, then that's not really a good thing. I've done that once and I, I, it didn't work out well for me. So I try and go every three days. So day one for me, I do squats, three sets of five. I do overhead press, three sets of five, and I do bench press, three sets of five. And on my second day, you know, three days later, I'll do deadlifts. Uh, I'll do one set of five uh, going really heavy. Well, what's heavy for me anyway? I'll do uh, three sets of five on the squats again. I'll do three sets of five again on the bench press. And I'll do three sets of five. Depending on if the machine is open, I'll do either lat pull downs or, or I'll do rows. And... I don't because my time is limited at the gym. I I don't like sitting around waiting for the machine to open up, and, and I I just don't like wasting time. I don't like cooling off. I, I I don't have the kind of time that I would like to have to to be at the gym to wait um for for people to get off. So that's been my routine over the past three months, and I've I've had some tremendous results. What I always look to do every time I go to the gym is. Either the weight has to go up or the repetitions have to go up for me. Um, if I do three sets of five, let's just say, um, again, I'm not very strong at all. So right now I'm doing three sets of five, 170 pounds on the bench press. The next time I go to the gym, if I do three sets of five of, at 170, then the following time I go to the gym, I'll put, on, I'll put uh, five pounds more on the weight. So I'll, I'll be at 175. And if for some reason I can't do three sets of five at 175, I take notes on what I did. So let's say, you know, the first set was was I did uh, five reps. The second set I did four reps. And the third set I did, you know, three reps. I will stay at 175 until I can hit three by five, uh, th you know, three sets of five repetitions. And that's how I've been measuring my progress. I always write down what I'm doing. I can never understand how guys just just go to the gym and, and not write anything down and just push weights and not even sure, you know, what they're recording. Because for me, I need to see progress. I need to see that either the repetitions are going up or the weight on the bar is going up. And I'm a big proponent of free weights. Um, I, I prefer free weights over machines, but in my opinion, it, I don't think it matters all that much for my goals and my basic goals for lifting weight is to get stronger. I'm not doing it to, to become a bodybuilder. I'm not doing it to look good. Now looking good is a side effect of that because my nutrition has improved, um, significantly since I started 
uh, lifting weights a- a- as it is. So, you know, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my nutrition, but but basically, my main goal is improving my strength, and and I've seen some tremendous results so far. Now, granted, there is such thing as beginner gains, but I think I'm past that by now after three months. So. You know, just for example, on squats, I, I started off at 135 pounds and, and now I'm at 225 uh, doing three by five. So, you know, I, I like where I'm at when I I think the most I've ever done three by five is 250. Um, so I'm slowly getting there. Um, now, for guys my age, you know, mid 40s or, or, you know, late 30s to, to 60s or whatever. The biggest difference for me this time around is the warm up. And I take extra special care doing warm up. So let me give you an example. If I'm doing squats, I'll do 25 repetitions of squats on just the bar. And then, you know, a- after a minute or so, I'll put on um because the bar is 45 pounds. And then I'll put on 225 plates. And I'll do uh, one set of five reps. And then I'll put on, um, I'll replace those with 45 pound plates on each side. That's 135 pounds. And I'll do one set of five repetitions. And then I'll put on um, 25 pound plates again on top of that, uh, on top of those 245s. So now I'm, I'm squatting 185 and I'll do five repetitions. And then I'll, as those, as the weight gets uh, higher, I give myself a little bit more rest in in between those warm up sets, and then you know once I do that one set of of five at one eighty five, that's you know that's when I'll take off the you know the twenty five pound plates and put another pair of uh, forty five pound plates to get me to two hundred twenty five pounds, and I have found by being diligent and working out uh, warming up in that way, I have been able to do squats twice a week, and and guys. It, this is a huge deal for me because I have, through years of doing Uchimata incorrectly, I tore my my left hamstring. So that for for years after I tore that left hamstring and never healed right, every time I used to do squats, that left hamstring would always pull, and I could only do squats once a week. But now because I'm being a little bit more diligent in my stretching, and being a lot more diligent uh, with my warming up. I'm doing squats twice a week and and I'm not having any ill effects from the hamstring. And when it comes to squats, I make sure I go at least parallel. My, my hips are parallel with my knees. So let me get to the point of all of this. This has helped me tremendously in judo over the past three months. And I know it's no secret, obviously, the 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 competitors – um, lift weights, at least they should be. I know most of them do. But for you, for us recreational guys, I really think it's important to supplement your judo with, well, lifting weights. And, I, and I'll tell you why. As we get older, the body breaks down a lot easier and it's a lot more difficult to uh, heal. We just don't heal as fast in our 40s. And we don't recover as fast. And I got to say, before lifting weights, every time I do Rondori out there or was doing Rondori, I feel like I was one bad twist away from, from blowing out a shoulder or, or, or maybe injuring my knees or, or pulling a muscle somewhere. That, that's how I really felt. I mean, it's sad to say that, but doing judo three times a week, or, or two, you know, two to three times a week just wasn't enough for me to feel. Uh, I, I, I don't know if safe is the right word, but I really felt like I might break down at any second, um, especially being a lightweight guy. You know, I'm about 150 pounds, 155 tops, and most people I do, most people in their 40s are not 155. They, they, they tend to put on weight. Um, and, and they tend to be a lot stronger than me. That's just, that's just how it is. And, and I I mean, I can accept that, but with that comes the challenge of always having to do Rondori and, and, you know, practice with people who are at least 
30 pounds heavier. At least that's my experience with me. Uh, Judo Joe, you know, my friend, he's about 160. He's about the only guy that I know that's my age um, that's, you know, that that's skilled in Judo. That I And that's why I, I do a lot of Rondori with him because I feel safe doing Rondori with him because I feel like he's not going to do something stupid um, and, and tear out a shoulder. Whereas, you know, somebody who's 200 pounds... I don't care how old you are. They they tend to do play judo very strong in a certain way, and I mean I'll do randori with them, but but it's I usually felt very unsafe and not more more because of me, not because of them. But now that I've gotten stronger, I don't have that feeling anymore, and I have gotten a lot stronger over the past three months. It, it I definitely feel it when I'm doing randori. I feel like I. I don't want to go as far as saying I feel indestructible, but that feeling of like, you know, let's say I'm turning in for a throw and I just don't get it quite right. And sometimes, you know, you kind of get torqued up. Well, you know, months prior, I, I would feel like, oh, my God, I almost hurt my shoulder there. But now it's like I, I feel very strong. My body feels very much like it can handle that kind of stress because I'm I'm constantly stressing it every three days with heavy weights. So I feel like my body can handle those stress, not only in my shoulders, but in my knees. And I feel like, you know, let's say if I'm doing a low Sayanagi against somebody who's heavier, because I don't like dropping to the knees. I really prefer staying on my feet. Well, I don't feel like my knees are going to give out just because the guy is heavier. Even though likely months ago, that would never actually happen. But it feels like it's about to happen. Um, because again, I was very light and not very strong. So I'm going to continue lifting weights. I, I've i said it before that I plan on competing this year. I've really narrowed it down to one competition, and that's going to be later on in the summer. I want to do the U.S. Open, which should be in, in the uh, Miami area of Fort Lauderdale. And the reason why I want to do that particular tournament is because I am more than likely going to have guys my age um, in my weight division. Because a lot of the other local tournaments, they they spread them apart at you know light, medium, and heavy. So there's a big uh, weight range to to be at. But I want to be at a tournament where there are other masters level competitors in the under sixty six kilo division, um, and that's the that's the division that I'm going to be fighting in. Um, so I mean, you know, Lord willing, I mean, I'm hoping that there'll be some competition there. I I you know, I def- definitely will do my best, but, you know, I'm not going to go in there expecting winning at all or anything like that. I just I just want to get out there. Um, you know, it's been a long time since I've done any real tournaments and I want to I, I want to give it a go, but I want to be the most prepared that I can be and as strong as I can possibly be heading into that tournament. And that's why, you know, instead of doing some New Year's resolution and starting in. January, I decided to start this at the end of October. And I'm glad I did because I feel like, you know, for a tournament that's in July, I'm ahead of the game. Um, though likely the, the anybody else showing up will, will probably be stronger than me and better than me. But that's okay because I just want to I just want to get out there and, and experience a, a, a tournament again. I, I think that would be a lot of fun. I think it would be great for my overall judo development. And I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to make sure that my calendar is clear, and uh, I I want to I want to I really really want to do this. Just I I'm not going to go to a bunch of tournaments. I just don't have that kind of time. But if I'm going to pick one, um, it's going to be that one. I, I'm going to forego the Sunshine State games because I I I've seen the numbers. The numbers seem to be dwindling with that. Um, so I picked the U.S. Open. Hopefully they will be uh, a lot more organized than they were last year because there is no way in hell that I'm going to be sitting in a line for six hours to register. I mean, that something's got to be done about that. And I hope anybody who's part of that tournament organization, I hope you're listening because you guys, you look, you ran a great tournament, but that registration process was, was unacceptable. And I hope you guys do better this coming up year. Now, before I talk about um, the next subject on this podcast, I want to touch briefly on uh, the my nutrition over the past several months and how it's been beneficial to me for to to not only building muscle but it's um, helped me cut some fat. So I'm looking leaner than I have in, in quite some time. I'll, I'll make it real quick, guys. It's really simple. 
<laughs> this this is what I do. I'm not suggesting you guys do this, but this is what I do. Breakfast, I eat bacon and eggs and maybe a slice of toast. Lunch and dinner, whatever I can cook on a grill is what I typically eat. And since I'm a simple person with simple tastes, that usually means either grilled chicken wings or or steaks. And I'll usually have some broccoli with that. Well, if I have chicken wings, I won't have broccoli. I, I don't like eating broccoli and, and chicken together for, for whatever reason. Not wings anyway. I, I like it mixed up in pasta and, and such. But a lot of times I'll have a steak and some broccoli or a steak and a sweet potato. And that's it. Pretty boring, I know. But I cut down on the carbs. Um, I, You know, I'm not going to go carb-free I mean, I I did as for the for the weeks leading up to my cruise, but that's because I wanted to look really lean. I I did manage to get slightly under fourteen percent body fat. I'm a little bit above that now. I think I'm about fifteen percent right now. But in order for me to get to my fighting weight, I'm gonna have to cut some body fat for sure, especially if I'm trying to put on some muscle. Um, and that shouldn't be too difficult for me for the weeks leading up to the tournament. But that's it. Look. I, I, I would say whatever you can grill is is what you should be eating. So I would stay away from fried foods. I stay away from uh, lots of pasta. Now, look, I, I don't go crazy because, you know, like like uh, my birthday a couple of days ago, we got pizza. I had a couple of slices of pizza for, for, for dinner. No big deal. I mean, you know, I'm not going to go crazy because I'm not, I'm not a bodybuilder. I'm just trying to build some strength and build some muscle. But I think it's important to eat healthy. So I, I try and eat some vegetables. Uh, you know, I have a sweet potato and um, and a lot of protein. And I do make some protein shakes as well. I, I'll, I'll mix in some protein powder uh, with some almond milk or coconut milk. And, uh, you know, mix in some strawberries or banana. It creates a, a really, really nice tasting shake. I, I, I stay away from milk as much as possible. Um, in the mornings, I'll, I'll have a cup of coffee. And instead of using sugar as a sweetener, I'll use uh, a little bit of honey. And I tend to like the taste of that. But yeah, my nutrition's pretty bland, but it works for me. I've seen results and, um, you know, I'm, I'm managing to gain strength while cutting some fat. And um, I don't count calories. I just, I just, um, I really, if you stick with a lot of lean meats and vegetables, it would be very hard to, to eat, um, so many calories where you are, you know, gaining a lot of excess weight. But that's what's been working for me in the gym and for nutrition. When it stops working, well, then I'll, I'll change it up. Yeah, that's just what I'll do. So I want to talk about Ogoshi a little bit. And this is a throw that I've gone back to in terms of practicing, especially as of late. I think it's an important, I think it's important for well, not only beginners, but experienced judoka a lot uh, alike to go back to the basics to ensure that what you are doing is proper and to reinforce, you know, these basic throws that you truly are mastering them as you're getting older. And it's what's interesting to me is that when I go back to throws that in my mind, I feel like I've got a really good handle on. I tend to learn something new, something new about myself, something new about the throw. And with Ogoshi, that's certainly no different. Uh, um, it's really interesting to see how a throw can, by going back to a throw that you can learn something new out of it or learn something new about yourself. But that's exactly what I found happening to me as I've been practicing Ogoshi lately. So in my club over the past, uh, well, let's see, the last time I was there, um, I was working uh, with the lead sensei, and sensei. we were, I wanted to work on Ogoshi. We were working on a couple of other techniques, but Ogoshi was one of them because I feel, because he's a lefty, I feel that Ogoshi is an excellent throw to use in a lefty versus righty situation. And not only that, I just feel Ogoshi is a building block throw. For those who may not realize it, it's, um, well, I'm sure most of you know this. It's Ogoshi is part of the Gokyo no Waza in the first set. They call it the Dai uh, Ikkyo. Hopefully I didn't butcher that. 
the first set in the Gokyo no Waza is typically throws that are taught to beginners in the beginning. Um, you know, throws like Deyashi, Hirai, Ukigoshi, Osorogari, Ogoshi, Ochigari, Ippon Sayanagi, Sasai, Surikomiyashi, and Hizuguruma. A lot of those throws, beginners and intermediate players, a lot, uh, uh, judoka alike, tend to practice those these throws a lot. I think some clubs concentrate on just this first group a little bit more than they should because it's, <laughs> there's a total of 40 throws in the uh, Gokyo no Waza. And, you know, I think it's important to be able to, as an instructor to cover all 40. And I think I've, you know, I've talked about this before that the Gokyo no Waza is a, is a fantastic, um, the way that the throws are structured, I think it's a fantastic syllabus, base syllabus to use to measure a student's progress. But I digress. Ogoshi is in that first group, and it's it's what I consider one of those throws that are typically taught to a first day beginner. If it's not if it's not Ogoshi, it's Osotogari. And for me it was Osotogari, but for a lot of you it's Ogoshi. And when you learn Ogoshi, it's pretty basic. You you put your hand around, you know, the guy's back and or girl's back. You know, you, you, you grip at the sleeve, you bend your knees, you roll them over your hip, and presto, you got Ogoshi. And look, it's a tremendous accomplishment for a beginner to be able to do that throw and not worry about, you know, maybe how the throw feels or, you know, whether you got down low enough or, or things along those lines. If you, For a lot of beginners, if you're bending the knees and, and rolling the person over your hips, you found some success. But for experienced people, for people like myself that's been doing this for a while, you you tend to learn how throws feel or really how all throws should feel. And I found myself realizing that with my Ogoshi, it's not quite where I want it to be. And granted, you know, if I did the Ogoshi that I was doing the other night for, let's say, a black belt test, I would pass. It would be fine. You know, I might be scored, a, you know, out of five, I might get a three out of five, but that's not good enough for me because I want to, I want a five out of five. I want when I do Ogoshi, if I demonstrate Ogoshi, if I'm going left versus right or whatever the case may be, I want somebody to be able to look at that and say, wow, that is a beautiful looking Ogoshi because I really believe with Ogoshi, that is the building block for many other throws in the judo syllabus. So I recorded myself doing Ogoshi, and, and granted, you know, the sensei of the club is about 30 pounds heavier than me. He's a little bit taller. That really shouldn't matter. I do find it difficult when doing throws on a crash pad. If I'm not moving with somebody who's heavy, it is difficult for me to just generate Kazushi, especially if they're not giving me anything, um, you know, when I enter for the technique in terms of Kazushi. Uh, I'm not saying that was the case here. I'm saying maybe that was the case. I don't know. But doing the throw on a crash pad, having a very little entry point and worrying about, you know, making sure that he lands on the crash pad. That that's all st- that's all tough for me uh to to do when working on throws with somebody who's heavier. I I've said it before. I'm not a huge pl- fan of crash pads. It really messes with my mind and and, and messes with how I do things and how I like to practice my entries and things like that. It's just, it just throws me off. I'm not a big fan of it. I, it's for me, I just treat it as a necessary evil. But I noticed in the video when I recorded myself, my Kazushi was not good enough. Um, and my entries was not low enough. And, and it's so strange when I do these throws and I, I I say okay I'm gonna get lower I'm gonna bend my knees and I look at it on the video I'm barely going any lower when when I do the technique I feel like oh man my my butt was practically at my heels that's how it feels but then when I look on the video it's like gosh I wasn't even close at all so it's interesting to to knowing what I know now and trying to master uh, this technique it's what's interesting to me is. As I've gotten better at judo over the years and I've progressed and I've practiced more, judo becomes less and less for me about throwing people than it, and it becomes a little bit more about mastering my own body and fitting it in places 
that I need to put it in in order to be successful. I'm not sure if that makes sense. I hope that makes sense, but it now yeah, I know judo's about throwing people. Don't get me wrong. I I I get it. It's a lot of fun. I love it. Uh, I don't know why I love it. I just do. But as I try to get better, it's more about me mastering where I put my body in throws, how I position myself, how I move. And it becomes less about, you know, gosh, this guy is stiff arming me. This guy can't even move. He's just just being really stiff and this and that. It really becomes less and less about that. That's why, you know, I I, I was in a discussion earlier this week on, on Reddit about, you know, somebody was talking about how, you know, they got a guy at their club that's that's really stiff. He, he kind of lumbers around and stuff. It's really hard to throw him and things like that. And, you know, I, I kind of I tried to encourage him and let him know that, hey, you know, these are opportunities for you to grow as a judoka. And it, it, because as you get better, really the challenges in front of you have, have to me anyway, you know, and I'm really not trying to be esoteric here, but the challenges have, to me, have far more to do with what you are doing than what the other person is doing. I feel like in judo, there is always an answer to the situation that you're facing. And, you know, as I've gotten better, as I've gotten older, you know, that answer, you know, it should be less and less about, you know, dude, can you loosen up and, and more about, okay, this guy is going to be really tight. This, this guy is, is, you know, being very difficult with me and Ron Dory. How am I going to move and throw in a way that's going to take advantage of what he's presenting me? And that's really, you know, that's the ultimate challenge in judo. And, and, you know, going back to Ogoshi, you know, I could sit here and complain and say, um, you know, he wasn't really giving me much in in terms of Kazushi, you know, when I'm pulling and stuff like that. But but this is a good opportunity for me, even when just practicing the basics by saying, OK, what do I need to do to get him to in the position where I could effortlessly throw him and throw him in a way that it's it, I don't feel he just he just goes over very easily. And and so these are this is why I'm going back to the basics. You know, I could sit here and be practicing, you know, something like reverse Sayanagi and that's all fun and dandy and stuff. But the basics for me to look to master the basics, I think is critical for my own development moving forward. And I'm look, I might be getting older. I'm certainly getting slower. Actually, there's no might about yeah. I am getting older. I am definitely getting slower, but it doesn't mean that I can that I stop improving at judo. And judo is just it's so much more than just you know speed and 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 uh, and strength and, and stuff like that. One can improve even as your physical skills are diminishing. You could get better at doing certain things, and you you have to take the challenges that are ahead of you and. A- aging is one of the biggest challenges anybody on the mats has to face. Um, but you can still improve in spite of that. I-, I-, I really believe that. And that's why I'm going back to the basics because I want to improve. Uh, you know, being able to blast in there with, with Ogoshi that, uh, with speed and, and getting to the right time, that- that's not going to do it for me anymore. I have to find another way. And-, and I believe that I can get better. Now, that doesn't mean that, you know, if I go against some some young spry 20 year old lefty that I'm going to blast them with Ogoshi. That doesn't mean that, but, but it still doesn't mean that we can't improve as we get older. And as these new challenges are, uh, we face these new challenges. So for me, in short, Ogoshi is my next challenge along with Yoko Tomonagi. I still want to have those. I want these two throws in my repertoire before, you know, over the next six months, that's, that's, um, that's important to me. I've got I've got other throws that I can depend on, you know, in a competition. And you know, I've talked about it before. I, I would say Osotogari is my uh, Tokui Waza. I I feel like I can get that on anybody in in most situations. But um, I I need to expand my uh, judo vocabulary, my judo uh, repertoire list, and and have other throws that I feel I can be dependent on. All right, it's that time of year again. What time is it? No, not you, New Year's. It's that, no, not my birthday either. 
that time of year where the International Judo Federation has their referee and coaching seminar. No! And every year when they have this seminar, uh, news of what is changing and clarifications of uh, rule changes that they've discussed in the previous year, they come to fruition here. It's it's practically, you know, it's gone over with all the coaches and the referees, and they set the tone on how the rules and their changes are going to be called moving forward for the IJF World Tour calendar. And in this case, we're talking about uh, the new year, 2018. Now, I went into extensive detail last year on what was covered at the uh, seminars. I did not sit there and watch five hours worth of seminars uh, over the weekend uh, or over that weekend. So this seminar took place, took place in uh, Mitrasil, Austria. I've never been there, but I'm sure it's a very lovely place. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to run down some of the rule changes that caught my eye. I'm probably not going to cover everything, but some of these rule changes I, I were very surprising. And unlike last year, some of these changes I I don't really support. Now, I'm not going to cover what I've already covered before. And what I mean by that is largely Wazari Awaseti Ipon. I'm not going to cover that. I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the rule changes I did not realize were going into effect. Starting with a big one, uh, no more Kansetsu Waza or Shime Waza if both a athletes are standing. Um, my initial reaction to this is that I don't like that. And what that says to me, and, and granted, I did not watch the coaching seminar where you know where you got Neil Adams and and whoever explaining uh, what these new rules are. But what that tells me, no more flying Juji Katami. Uh, and I don't know why the IGF would go this route. It certainly sounds to me that look, that's that you're so they go on to explain uh, what constitutes Nawaza versus what constitutes as you know uh, uh, you know uh, Tachiwaza. So by this definition, and, and we'll go into definitions on how they clarified what is a Nawaza situation, but by this definition, it sounds to me that you cannot do flying Juji Katami. And uh, for, the, for, for Oast Nation out there who don't know what that is, it's the flying armbar. Now, I don't like that. You know, flying Juji Katami is something that I have not seen very often in tournaments. But man, when you see it, it's exciting and it's awesome to see and it, it's a great technique. I've, you know, I've had fun, you know, with it. I've never pulled it off in Rondori or any competition. I've never even tried in, in, in a competition. But to me, flying Juju Katami is one of those techniques that, you, you know, you kind of practice after class. I've never been formally taught it, but I've, I've seen it demonstrated, you know, let's say on YouTube or in certain judo books that I have. And, you know, I've tried it in class. Not very hard to do, but it's a great technique to catch somebody off guard if they're just in that right situation. You know, especially if they're, um, you know, I would think, and again, I've never actually pulled it off, but I would think, you know, if you're tired, you know, the person's bending over a little bit, bam, you could slap that thing on and, and catch somebody off guard and get a nice submission out of it. I, I think it's, um, I, I think it's a great technique. Um, it's rarely seen, but when you see it, it's exciting and I'm not really sure why they would um, do this. Perhaps there was some contest on the world tour that I didn't see where somebody's arm got seriously broken. I've seen other people comment that that it's a technique that when it's applied, there's no escape. And some people feel that the IGF are creating rules to at, at least allow a counter to every um, throw that is uh, available, and yeah, there really isn't. <laughs> there really isn't a counter to flying Juju Katami, other than you know, hopefully the guy messed up and you can escape it. But I don't even know if that's the case. So please don't quote me on that. It's a shame if flying Juju Katami is out. That that's a shame. That's why my initial reaction is that I don't like it. Now, if they're doing this to prevent Waki Katami, I can understand that. That's a technique that um, can lead to a lot of injuries. 
because there's a it's very difficult to escape Waki Tommy. As a matter of fact, you know, all the years that I've been doing judo, I, I can't think of an instance where I've been taught how to escape Waki Gatami. And I can understand the safety aspect. Look, the IJF, in all their wisdom, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, they're trying to create a sport that is not only viewer friendly, but but is exciting to watch. And what is not exciting to watch is injuries. And, you know... And I'm going to get into some of the head diving. They changed a little of the rules on that for in a good way. But they feel, and it's this way in any sport, you can't have, if you're trying to grow your viewership base and become more mainstream around the world, you can't have guys getting routinely injured um, with certain techniques. I get it. I don't like it, but I get what they're trying to do. I don't necessarily agree with it. Um, I know a lot of the old school guys, man, I, I feel for you guys, you know, as I've been doing this podcast more and more, and I've heard from you over the, over the past year plus, I feel for some of you old, old school guys, guys have been doing judo for, for 30, 40 years. I, I got to think that you guys, when you see these, these rule changes, you think to yourselves, man, this is completely unrecognizable to when I started judo. And I think that's a shame. I, I think, you know, you, you almost become marginalized a little bit and and your opinions almost aren't being heard and you're not being represented at the highest levels and i i think that's a shame i i uh i mean i i know the leg grab ban was a big deal uh in high level competition i understand why they did that but i think i think schools you know clubs around the country and certainly around the world have a right to teach you know Morote gari they should teach it and any any teacher that doesn't teach it is is being uh you know a little negligent unless you're just a coach that's that's training high level athletes that's different but i'm you know for your recreational clubs you know i i think techniques like you know flying jujikatami should be taught and waki gatami should be taught and rotegari should be taught i think that should be taught regardless of what goes on at the ijf another rule change uh rolling ipon now counts as long as there is no break during the landing so what that means to me is if a person is thrown and they land on their shoulder, um, but they're rolled onto their back, um, as long as there is not a break in that action or movement, that um, that's going to be called an ipon now. And my initial reaction to that is I also do not like that. I thought for 2017, they got ipon right. I thought, you know, ipon has to be a throw that is hard to achieve. And you, now that you have Wazari Awaseti Ipon, to add this stipulation to, to the rolling Ipon, it's basically, in my mind, it's continuation. You know, you land on your shoulder or a certain part, but if there is continuation that brings that throw up to an Ipon where you're landing mostly on your back, they're going to call it Ipon now. I don't like it because it seems like they're going, it's an artificial way to increase the amount of Ipon in a contest. And now with Wazari Awaseti Ipon back, which I love, I don't think this change was necessary. That's just my opinion. I, I don't, you, you know, I don't like it. I, I don't like rolling Ipon. The, when you saw an Ipon last year, I nine times out of ten, there was no question it was an Ipon. Now I'm talking about throws, of course, not not Osai Komi or, you know, uh, Shime Waza or Kansetsu Waza. I'm not talking about Ipon uh, getting, you know, on the ground. I'm talking about throwing Ipon. And last year, when the ref scored Ipon, nobody debated it. Now you leave, in my opinion, and I could be wrong on this, but in my opinion, you leave room for debate whether or not, you know, if there's you're going to have rolling Ipon, you leave room for the debate whether that's an Ipon or whether that's a Wazari. I thought they had it right last year, and I'm not a big uh, fan of this. What I am a big fan of is this next rule change, which we talked about in in uh, a previous episode when I talked about the proposed rule changes. It goes, voluntary use of the head for defense to avoid landing in or escaping from a score will be given Hansoku Maki. And I think that's the absolutely right call. And as far as I'm concerned, not only that, the it, it should go further. 
the the athlete or the national governing body should be fined every time that happens as well. Because look, the IJF and judo as a whole cannot afford to have somebody's neck broken on a live stream or on live TV for an event. It can't happen. And while Hanso Kumaki is a is a serious enough offense, you're done for the day. You you just you I just to me you got to take it a step further. Just like in the NFL where they are finding any players for headshots like safeties, you know, hitting wide receivers leading with the head, you know, head on head collisions. The NFL, you know, not only is a player fine, you know, the, the NFL finds players for that now. And I think the IJF, they I love the rule change. They didn't go far enough. I think players and and or and or the national governing bodies that al- allow players to do this, they should be fined. And, and you know, maybe that's an extreme but head diving, again, you cannot have people getting concussed and, and people's necks potentially getting broken on, on a live stream. That is bad for judo. That's bad for business. And it's, it's just bad. It's bad all around. And, and I'm glad um, they're raising any this kind of thing to a Han Sokumaki. So now this does not apply to involuntary landing of the head. So, you know, especially with throws like Seru Otoshi. A lot of times people land on their heads. That's involuntary. And I think we all know the difference when somebody's using their head voluntarily versus involuntarily. For Osai Komi, the Uda position is now valid. Now, I looked at the picture and the document. According to that picture um, that they use in the example, the person is holding down an opponent with their hips facing the ceiling while cradling the opponent's arm and leg. You guys would have to see the picture to understand what they're saying, but it looks like, and I don't know if it's if this is new or not. I mean, I thought I saw uh, people win competitions last year with their hips completely facing the ceiling um, and their back to their uh, uh, opponent. Um, while holding them down in Osai Komi. I thought that was good to go, but I, I, I don't know. I guess they're clarifying it here that, that that position is now valid. So, you know, imagine if you're cradling them from the neck and the head and your hips are, you know, you're you're arching your back, keeping keeping the person held down with hips facing the ceiling. I guess that's good now. Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that either way. To me, Osai Komi is Osai Komi if you're holding the person down on their back for 20 seconds, that's going to be an pawn, no matter how you do it. Um, all right, don't take that literally. But you know what I mean. Here's a rule change I really don't like. Shimewaza is not allowed with either your own or your opponent's belt or bottom of the jacket or using only the fingers. I don't like that at all. I think there's a lot of creative chokes that can be done using the opponent's um, own... Uh, judogi or your own judogi. I know a lot of jujitsu guys um, have some really nifty chokes by using the bottom of the gi jacket. You can't do that in judo anymore. I don't like it at all. Uh, not one bit. Another rule change. Um, I, I don't know if this is new, but the time between classic kumikata and making an attack has been extended up to 45 seconds as long as there's a pro- positive progress uh, progression. I'm not sure how new that is. I thought it was 45 seconds last year. And now it, it seems like for any other grip than your standard sleeve lapel grip, you've got to attack immediately. Where it seemed last year if you had uh, alternative grippings, they would give you a, few, uh, a, a little bit more time to set up your attacks. But now it's got to be followed by an immediate attack. And I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look at the IJF video I'm not sure what they mean by an immediate attack in this instance. Is that is that within one second? Is that within three seconds or five seconds? I don't know what immediate attack it, uh, immediate attack means in this context. I'll have to take a look at the, um, you know, what's being said or, or what's being demonstrated on the video. Here's another item that I thought was very interesting because I thought this was an illegal grip, but either they changed the rule or maybe I misunderstood it last year. Uh, the bear hugs allowed. Um, you you got to. Uh, it's it's not valid to to ha- do the bear hug grip uh, simultaneously, but you got to You got to have one grip on first, and then follow up with the second grip. So it seems. So I I guess that means. So let's say 
you know, you're you're trying to go with a, a goshi, and you've got the grip around the back, and, and your goshi's not working. You could come around with the bear hug, and you 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 can grip your own hand. Um, it doesn't have to be some weird grip where you're you're not quite uh touching your own hands. So the bear hugs back. Apparently, um, you just can't do it simultaneously. You know, like you see in movies or whatever, where you're crushing. You know, you see like the bad guy picking up the small guy and they're crushing their back with a big bear hug. You can't do that, but not simultaneously. But you can go one after the other and you, it has to be a certain sequence, I guess. But the bear hugs back, I think that's a good thing. In terms of leg grabs, um, I'm sure Christian out there, you'll love this one. There, Well, the leg grabs aren't back, but now it's just the Shido. I think I discussed this in my last uh, a few episodes prior, but uh, leg grabs... Are now only counted as Shido, where years prior, I liked how they did it last year. I know it was confusing, maybe for for the fan base, well, when the, uh, the viewership anyway. I I don't know. My issue with the way that they're doing it now is, if you have no Shido and you're in your but you're losing a contest, or or maybe it's tied, you can you can use a, a couple of your Shidos in the so called bank. To stop people from doing their, you know, a technique like Uchimata. Say somebody's coming in for an Uchimata. You think you're going to get caught. You just grab the leg. There's, you know, bam, the Shido. But, but hey, you didn't get thrown with Uchimata. I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure about that. I, I, I'll be interested to see how it plays out. Most of these players really weren't, you know, even when they didn't have a Shido on the board, they weren't really using that ability to leg grab to, to put a Shido on the board because... Because of how it was getting penalized in Golden Score, you know, Shido's were a much bigger deal. It seemed last year uh, than they will be this year. But um, I, I don't know. I'm curious to see how it plays out. I know those of you out there who would prefer the leg grabs back. I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. I've said that many times. But um, I don't. I didn't like you know an accidental touch of the pants being Hansokumaki. I, I don't like that. Um, now, in terms of leg grabs, you can Kouchi Makikomi and, and similar throws are back so long as you're not using your hands to grab the legs. But you can like kind of use your arm to kind of chicken wing your your uh, your arm around the leg while you're doing a throw like Kouchi Makikomi. That's back, and I think that's a that's a great thing because I I love Kouchi Makikomi. I think it's a great throw. The IJF went out of its way to clarify what is in the Waza situation, and this is very interesting to me. So they have defined that both athletes must have two knees on the floor for it to be considered Nawaza. And here are some other rules related to how they define Nawaza. Um, if there is no contact between the opponents, it must be Mate. So if if uh, if a person turtles and somebody is is trying to turn over the turtle and they just kind of give up and stand up and walk away, the ref's going to call Mate um, or Mate. Sorry. The person lying, if so, if a person is lying on the stomach on the ground, that's considered Nawaza. And here's the interesting one: uh, clarification on, on Nawaza situations. And I'm going to read it verbatim. Grip control from the standing athlete. We still consider an athlete on the knees in Tachiwaza. So they in the document you have a you know an athlete. You know, one guy is standing in white, and while the other guy is on his knees, the, the blue athlete is on his knees in Tachiwaza, and consequently, Tachiwaza regulation would be applied. However, if white does not attack immediately, then the referee must call Mate. The athlete on the knees cannot grab the legs to defend the throw with his arms, and if this happens, Shido will be given. So let, let, me, let me just clarify this one more time. Grip control from the standing athlete. Um, they're going to consider that Nawaza. If one guy is on his knees or on the ground in blue and the other guy is standing on his feet in white, that's still considered Tachiwaza. And um, the opponent on the ground cannot grab the legs to, um, in that situation. And this is really interesting to me because my initial reaction, for one, is that I don't like it. And it makes me wonder if Ryan Vargas's performance at the World Championships... Uh, if for those who don't know or don't remember, Ryan Vargas is uh, uh, represents Team USA. 
I wonder if his performance with him going three and one had anything to do with this change. And, you know, for those of you who don't remember, um, several episodes ago, right after the world championships, I talked about Ryan Vargas's performance and where he used a lot of sweeps on the ground by grabbing the legs and knocking the opponent over. Now, look, <laughs> Oz Nation out there was over the moon with joy and happiness, um, practically swooning, uh, all the while proclaiming that that sweep was invented by Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And Ryan Vargas says they were claiming Ryan Vargas was dominating the field with his Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in a Judo tournament. Now, I was not willing to go that far. Uh, as far as I see, it's all Judo. Um, but he was, Ryan Vargas was doing a lot of Entries, skillful entries into Nawaza, in my opinion, and sweeping guys by grabbing their legs while they were still standing. That is no longer valid. And it makes me wonder if the IJ, God, and I hope not. That would be awful. It makes me wonder if the IJF saw this and, and slapped down that kind of um, strategy. And I, I think it's a shame because as a whole, I think Team USA can be a Nawaza dominant, uh, uh, can take a Nawaza dominant approach to winning judo tournaments. There's nothing wrong with that. But for the IJF, the, the IJF has a clear vision on how they want um, their judo tournaments to look like. And it would appear to me that they made this rule change um, in response to Ryan Vargas' performance. And I think that's a shame. And quite frankly, I just don't see it any other way. This was a response to Ryan Vargas' outstanding performance at the World Championship. So, Ryan, I know you're not listening, and maybe your friends aren't listening. But if your friend's friend friend is listening, just know that I'm in your corner on this one because I think that's a shame. I, I just I think you have a bright future, and it's really unfortunate that your abilities on the ground are being neutered. Um because of what you managed to do. And um, man, that's awful. And I'm sure I'm sure the Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu guys out there that have an interest in Judo, you know, you see something like this, you're just alienating a group of people. And there's just it's it's not right. I I, I don't I don't agree with it one bit. Um it it's it's a valid sweep. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, a failed, you know, a failed Yoko Tomonagi you know, you're on the ground. You should be able to grab the leg. If your foot is still on, you know, let's say the opponent's abdomen area, you should be able to grab the legs and use that foot to push them back while you're grabbing the legs, you know, by the ankles, knock them over and and, and dominate in the waza. You should be able to do that. Come on. I, I, that's awful rule change. That's probably, of all the rule changes they've had here that I don't like, I think this is the worst of them. All right, so in terms of rule changes, I think those are the biggest ones. I probably missed a couple of them, but um, those are the biggest ones going into the IJF World Tour for 2018. And, and I'm sure after the World Championships, there'll be some modifications as well. They'll tweak some of the rules. But um, yeah, that's it. Uh, unlike last year, I thought some of the changes last year were great. I don't I don't feel that, that way this year. Um, yeah, not at all. Uh, I don't feel that way. I, I think, I think you're restricting judo's uh, uh, judo's ability to be creative and dynamic. I I think you're you're restricting that, and I I think it's a shame. Now, speaking of uh, Ryan Vargas and Team USA, there's some USA judo related items that I wanted to get to real quick. Starting with uh, Corinne Shigamoto. Um, who was the chief operating officer of USA Judo, and I say was, and I'm being accurate with that, uh, she's resigned her position. Now, for those of you who have who are USA Judo members, I'm sure at one point or another, uh, you've had to deal with Corrine over the past, I don't know, several years she's been at that post. I've always felt that she's done a good job. She's always been uh, responsive with the uh, email. Um, I thought... I. I, I thought she she served USA Judo well, and I would like to wish her um, the very best in, in all her future endeavors. I'm not sure who USA Judo is going to replace at this point, but um, but they, whoever that is, they'll have big shoes to fill because I thought I thought uh, Corinne did a good, very good job. USA Judo also announced that uh, Corey Sanders is leaving as well. 
Corey had been there for a while and was the um, the membership coordinator. So anytime you had an issue with your membership with USA Judo or whatever the case may be, he was always kind of the uh, first line of defense, so to say, uh, when it come to ha- came to handling uh, uh, membership related items. So what that means is, well, well, first off, uh, Corey, I wish you the very best of luck in all your future endeavors. But what that also means is that uh, USA Judo has some job openings. So if uh, you want to work for the organization, feel free to shoot them an email. Not sure what they pay, but uh, for me, it's probably not enough. <laughs> there was another really cool uh, news item related to USA Judo. Um, they announced that they've got uh, an international training center pilot program. And according to the uh, the news clipping or the item that I received, where did I see this? Did I see this on Team USA site or, or somewhere else? I'm not quite sure, but it um, goes, Today, USA Judo announced a new venture with Pacific Rim Martial Arts Academy in Tigard, Oregon. Oh, I got a, my company's office is out there, or one of them anyway. Uh, let's see, continuing on. To create a... a to create the first USA Judo International Training Center, East Asia. The intent of this pilot program is to bring judo training and techniques from East Asian countries like Japan and South Korea, who have historically strong and successful judo programs and are perennially ranked in the top 10 internationally to American judoka. Features of this training, International Training Center, East Asia, will include the following. A full-time coach with extensive knowledge and experience in East Asian judo training and competition techniques, guests and part-time coaches, clinicians with high levels of East Asia judo techniques and training experience, one to two Japanese training and cultural tours per year with potential scholarship opportunities, and one to two tra- USA judo elite training, elite athlete training camps per year. USA Judo's first ITC will have its grand opening at uh, PRMAA February 17th to 18th, 2018 with athlete and coaching clinics featuring American, Japanese, and Chinese instructors. Uh, that's really cool. And this is sort of something that I've talked about over the past uh, past year, especially in the past several months, that USA Judo needed to have partnerships with other countries that produce um high level athletes. Now, what I would love to see one day is an international training center uh, South Miami, let's say, because it, you you can get a, a international training center, you know, in, in you know, on the East Coast of the United States, let's say. I mean, Miami would be convenient to me, but anywhere where you can get people from Brazil and Cuba and certain other places um and do the same thing. I think that would be fantastic. But you know what? This is a step in the right direction. Um, unfortunately I'll never fly out to Oregon because that's just, uh, um, that's really too far for me to go with all the responsibilities that I have here. But maybe some of you young guys, um, or some of you people that have a lot more free time than I do, um, can make it out there, especially on the weekend of February 17th and 18th and, and, um, and, and experience something new. And, and I mean, to have a full-time coach, um, with that kind of uh, experience, I think it's important to grow the program. And yeah, you got uh, well. I, I suppose on the East Coast, you got Jimmy Pedro and Jason Morris and a few other high-level coaches. But to 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 have a partnership with an existing uh, martial arts uh, club, because uh, I know they teach other things other than judo there. To have that kind of a part uh, a, a partnership with a with a, an outstanding club. Um, and have these kind of international coaches come over. That's a really good step in the right direction for USA Judo. So kudos to them. I think that's really exciting. And I hope the program's a success. All righty. It's about an hour and 14 minutes into this podcast, into this particular episode. And I think I should be wrapping things up. I'm sure you guys, if you've made it this far, congratulations. I salute you as always. As a reminder, if you want to shoot me an email, you can do so at judochopsuishow at gmail.com. You can follow me on Instagram uh, at Lavita Judoka. I think my Instagram page is awesome. You could also follow me on Facebook. You just do a search for Judo Chop Sui Podcast. I've got a number of you listeners out there that have friend requested me on my own personal page. I'm always down with that. I will never deny a friend request from a listener. 
So I appreciate you people hunting me down, following me, and taking a look at my own personal life. I think that's pretty cool. And you can follow me on Twitter, at La Vida Judoka as well, if you'd like some updates. I don't update the Twitter all that much. Uh, the, the the Instagram I really love because it, it um, I could share my life in pictures and not uh, bore you all to death with my opinions on anything. Which, on Facebook, I don't put my opinions on anything out there. Uh, certainly not political ones or anything like that. It's, it's a real mess. Oh, goodness, some of my friends. Good Lord. Anyway. I hope you all have a great rest of the week. I hope you have a great weekend. I hope you're having a happy new year. Train hard. Stay safe out there. Until next time, I'm out. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Open Gangnam Style.